So I'm writing a novel. Is <clears throat> So I'm writing a novel is the show where you join me, Oliver Brackenbury, on the journey of writing my next novel, from first ideas all the way to publication and promotion. In this one-man reality show, I'll share with you my ever-evolving thoughts and feelings on how I write, being a writer, and everything that entails at each stage of the process. I'll also answer listener questions and, sometimes, interview special guests. If you're the kind of person who likes to learn how things are made and get to know the people making them, then this is the show for you. I saw the sun at midnight, a falling star, my first though, burst low in the valley, flaming bright, put on my cloak, hurried into the night. I saw him. He stood on the hillside, silent, brooding, another dreamer, so first I thought, drawn from his dismal, unwarmed cot, as I had left my pen, half-finished page. Another dream. The glowing torch of a journey half-finished. A burning ship had through infinity journeyed. Ten thousands, ten thousands, ten thousands of miles. Ten thousands of years. I saw his eyes. He spoke a tongue I alone still knew, forgotten as his name, to all but a last few. Earth and mankind, how does life stand with you, the inheritors of this land? He remembered. Where old gods laughed while giants died and gold cities rose to tell man's pride, till continents quaked till oceans rose in steam, still the gods laughed at the death of man's dream. I fled that dead. And I shivered in my cloak, and told him then how law had nailed shackles on the hearts of men, and the dictates of order, the will of the great, had stifled man's freedom, had imprisoned his dreams. He laughed. Law is the jailer of man's natural wish, order, cold fetters of all that is free. Your civilization has betrayed you at last, and so from man's servant has become instead master. My ancient enemy. And Cain's eyes glowed. He shook his fist high. Let the minions of order know the lord of chaos has returned. I vanquished law once. I'll conquer yet again and force upon mankind the freedom he fears. And dead gods I will again defy. He strode away laughing into the cold night. Cain had returned, a new challenge begun. No falling star had flashed false light. I had seen the midnight sun. And that, of course, was a poem called Midnight Sun, written by Carl Edward Wagner. As, say, Conan was to Robert E. Howard, or Elric was to Michael Moorcock, still is Michael Moorcock, still with us, bless him, uh, so Cain was to Carl Edward Wagner. Before tragically dying in his early 50s, Carl wrote three novels and many short stories focusing on Cain. As part of my research for my novel, it felt like it would be silly of me to overlook him, even though Cain is a very different character from my own Vo. And after reading all three of the novels, I found myself really wanting to get a better understanding of the author behind Kane and how he's created and just generally, yeah, go deeper. So, of course, I did what any sensible person would do. I looked up to see if there was a podcast. Lo and behold, there was a podcast called The Dark Crusade. The Dark Crusade is dedicated to the life, work, and influences of writer, editor, and publisher Carl Edward Wagner. Every episode, Jordan Douglas Smith and his co-host discuss a different story of Wagner's covering the publication history and themes. The goal of the podcast is to read through the works of Wagner, learn more about him, and reignite interest in his work. Finding that a noble and worthy goal, I've decided to do my part, as it were, by having Jordan on the show. So, without further ado, let's go over to talk to Jordan Smith of the Dark Crusade podcast. And here we are with Jordan. Hey, how are you? Doing well. It's really nice to meet you, especially after not knowing I was talking to you and seeing you on the Whetstone Discord for a little while there. I didn't make the username connection. <laughs> 
Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to chat today. I'm, I'm pretty excited to talk some uh, Carl Edward Wagner, talk some Kane. Yeah, well, all right, let's get into it then. So right off the bat, what is the origin of your love of Carl Edward Wagner's writing, and how did this lead to starting Dark Crusade? As a younger person, I had encountered Carl Edward Wagner in, there was an Elric collection that was all different fantasy writers writing Elric stories. And so Wagner had written a story where Elric and his character Kane, who we'll be talking about later, sort of like meet up and go on an adventure together. And I remember like it really stuck out to me in that collection because there was implications that there were spaceships and like it was dealing a lot with like the dimensional hero travel which i just thought was really amazing um i think it was like that story and there's one other story that had like a Jimi hendrix character in it, and those <laughs> two like really stuck out in my head but then i didn't really think anything like i didn't really seek out anything else i was just like oh this is this one-off story in this collection of like elric stories and like that had more cox blessing or it was a licensed pastiche or... yeah yeah um shoot i wish i had the name of the collection it's like the white wolf or something like that but it was uh stories by I think Tanith Lee had a story in it uh, Michael Moorcock had a story in it himself it was like a new Elric story so it's just all these different famous authors of the time their take on the Elric character oh cool um, and it was like it had a Brom cover which I, I think that's why I originally got it was because the Brom cover uh, looked so badass but you know and then I didn't really seek out anything by Wagner for years and years and it was actually fairly recently well 2013 that I think rediscovered Wagner, which is I was at the um, Necronomicon in Providence, and I was at a panel for the King in Yellow. And um, Joseph Pulver, he's like a really great, he's a, a writer, editor. He, he edited a lot of uh, like King in Yellow, Robert Chambers collections. He just recently passed away, but he was on the panel and he was like, he said something like, not for nothing, like Carl Edward Wagner is the greatest King in Yellow writer of like all the people who are, who are doing this stuff. And at the time I was just like, yes, I'm so into Chambers and King in Yellow. So it's like, I gotta hunt down this Wagner guy. Oh. And it was around that time that Centipede had done the reprints of his uh, horror stuff. And you were able to get your hands on Centipede? Because every time I find out about a great Centipede edition, I'm like, oh, it's a beautiful hardcover, amazing art, sold out, never coming back. Yeah. So it's like, so it's like, oh, I can't get this and it's way too expensive now. <laughs> um, but luckily, one of my friends had it. And so he let me borrow them. So I read like both volumes and I just like tore through them and I loved them. And I was starting to get kind of obsessed with him and like learning like bits and pieces about him. And it's like, oh, like he wrote this horror stuff. And he was also an editor, which I thought was really interesting. And then I, you know, I, I found out that he wrote the Kane character. So I started trying to get my hands on some of those fantasy books. It's like, oh, yeah, that's that one story I read like years and years ago. And uh, luckily at the time, I mean, he's still really popular but his i was able to find his books online for like it was expensive but it wasn't crazy like how it is now i think yeah and uh so i just i was able to just wait and i, got, I actually bought a couple of lots of cane books for relatively cheap so i really lucked out sounds like you got in there before the sword and sorcery balloon started reinflating like it feels like the scene is gaining strength which i'm here for but it makes the books more expensive god damn it <laughs> mm -hmm. i know yeah and i think because his material was so hard to get a hold of. It made me want to share it with people and sort of like spread the love. Like I, I had no idea who Carl Edward Wagner was. And, you know, this this editor, Joseph Pulver, was like, you should read this guy. And so I read him and then I was like, well, I got to spread this too. I got to keep it, keep it going. That's what inspired me to start the podcast was I want to you know, very meticulously cover every single story that this guy wrote <laughs> and try to do as much research as I could about the time he was writing in, you know, original publications where you can find it. And then I just started doing more research and I was able to, you know, look at his papers and learn a little bit more about him as a person. And I just started like falling sort of like more and more in love with uh, the writer. And I was finding that the thing that I think is the most interesting is that he as an editor was a super champion of writers that's work was being lost. He would republish them to keep them alive. And then at the same time, he edited the year's best horror and he would read everything. There's even an instance where he read like a travel brochure for a French travel company that had a horror story in it. Huh. And that's one of the stories that he picked for that year's year's best horror. So he was just like a champion of the writer and, and good stuff. And so it's like this guy, that's not fair if he's been such a champion for other writers to himself be lost. And so yeah, I just wanted to spread the, the word of Wagner. 
Well, what's more enduring than a writer who loves writers? Yeah. Not all of them do. <laughs> Not all of them yeah. do. And yeah, I love your reasoning there. That's great reasoning. So you mentioned you're lucky enough to, uh, if I understand correctly, do you live near Wagner's papers or do you have to travel a bit to get to them? So originally I had to travel. I originally lived in Brooklyn, but I have a lot of friends in Providence. So I was coming up to Providence two or three times a year and I was starting to like schedule an extra day so I could spend a day at the John Hay Library, which is part Part of Brown University who owns, um, they own the Carcosa papers. Sorry, I should explain that. So Carl Edward Wagner started a small press called Carcosa. And it's, it's going along the lines of his whole mission statement in life of bringing up work that's being lost as he did reprints of a lot of the uh, like weird tales writers whose stories were starting to be lost. So like he published Manly Wade Wellman, Hoffman. Uh, no, it's gone. Memories lost in time like tears in the rain. <laughs> Well, that's okay, man. Listen, if you remember later, email them to me and I'll put them in the show. Hi, this is future Oliver here to tell you what Jordan passed along after the interview, which is that Carcosa Papers did two Manly Wade Wellman collections, an E. Hoffman Price collection, and a Hugh B. Cave collection. All right, book nerds, you can go hunt for those. And let's get back to the interview. Nice. So yeah, so it's the papers from that press and uh, also some of his personal papers are at the John Hay. So I was making time to come up there and look at it. But yeah, just just life changes, things change. And so uh, I made a move about a year and a half ago, moved to Providence. So now I'm super close to the John Hay. Things are are lifting. That library is now open to non-Brown students. So I'm I'm really looking forward to to getting back in the library and, and looking through his papers. Cool. A year and a half ago, you say, was there some kind of world event that uh, yeah. may have, <laughs> may have uh, who knows? Yes, that <laughs> may or may not be the case. <laughs> yeah. So how did you first discover the collection? And how would you say directly, I guess it's kind of obvious, but like, what's an example of how it directly benefited the podcast? Some specific treasure that made you go, ah, here's an episode or... Well, I was doing research for a job that I had, and I was just talking about how much I love the research. I did a little bit of research for Hippocampus Press, and they do like Lovecraftian fiction, Lovecraftian nonfiction. And so I was explaining to my friend who lives in Providence, like, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm loving this. This is so cool. And he's like, yeah, you like Wagner. Well, you know, we have the Wagner papers up at Brown. So that's how I discovered they were there. But I think one of the really, really cool things that I saw in the collection, which I was able to bring to one of my podcast episodes, was the original high school notebook that Carl Edward Wagner wrote, Bloodstone, is there. So I got to pick it up, hold it, look at it. And for people who aren't familiar with the Kane character, that is his fantasy character that's very loosely based on uh, Cain from the Cain and Abel story from the Old Testament. And it's really cool because I feel like there was a lot of sort of mystery and people, I felt like there's a lot of rumors about what exactly it was and how much was there. And so it was cool to see actually what it is. You know, you can see the, the beginnings of the story that becomes Bloodstone later. Uh, But it's really short. It's an introduction and part of a first chapter. Oh, okay. Because I was reading his essay, Raising Cain, which I'm sure you know, but for the listener, that was his essay, Raising Cain, all about coming out with the character of Cain. And in that, he said he wrote something like 10,000 words and he found the dialogue a bit syrupy or whatever, but he was like, that's how I like it. (laughs) And that must have been what you were looking at. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So, in you know, he's he's mentioned in, in various interviews that he started writing the book when he was in high school and then finished it and, you know, it turned into the book that was published. But it's one of those things where, you know, it's just that's how he tells the story. I think that he wrote this, you know, introduction, first chapter, and then the rest of this notebook is empty. So it's not it's left aside. So I'm sure he must have picked up a different notebook at some point, written some more, maybe tossed that. And then years later, picked up the story again where he left off and, and finished it. That's kind of my theory. I can't, you know, I don't have anything to prove it, but the fact that this like Ur text of Bloodstone is very short. Yeah, it's really neat to see. Well, yeah, I feel like when you come across a text like that, it closes something of the gap of the years and geography and so on. And you and the author, you're fascinated by, you know, it's almost a little bit like a Lovecraftian text, but it doesn't cause your horrible fate. You know, it's yeah. imbued with a kind of energy almost, mm-hmm. even if it's just the most cheap from the drugstore notebook, like whatever. It was touched by this guy who wrote this story that became this whole thing. I just think that's magical. Yeah. 
I won't lie, I do sometimes fantasize about this. Uh, do you ever fantasize about this? Uh, hmm, what if my notebook uh, yeah. winds up somewhere? <laughs> it's so interesting now, too. Some of the writers, like uh, Caitlin Kiernan, her papers are going to Brown and have gone to Brown. But since we live in the digital age, they've done like digital downloads of emails and digital documents. And that kind of blew my mind. Oh, okay. And are they doing hard copy printouts? Because I feel like with archiving anything digital, right? Like half the archiving is trying to keep a copy of a device that can read it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm. you know, I, I honestly don't know. I, I, I thought it was just a uh, tr- data transfer. But okay. yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how, how exactly they're keeping it. But, it, you know, it made me think of like also, oh, geez, these emails. Someone might be reading my personal email someday as part of a... <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well... I feel like I've taken too long getting into this, so Kane, in the intro to the second season of the Dark Crusade podcast, where you really get into Kane, you describe him as an anti-hero. I've seen him described as a monster, villain, tragic figure sometimes. Who is Kane, and how would you define him? Like, what makes him stand out mm-hmm. from Conan, Fafford, Elric, and all the other big names? So I often described Kane as an anti-hero, and someone responded to me once, and they're like, hey, he's not an anti-hero, he's a villain hero. And that's absolutely correct that's the correct way to to describe him so now i would definitely describe kane as a a villain hero an anti-hero would be you know the opposite of what we expect you know what the expectations of a hero would be and like you know i don't want to say classic sense but in the you know i guess whatever the societal expectations at that time what a hero would be like it's the opposite of all that but Kane is is not that. He's still, he's super intelligent. He's super strong. He has magical skills. But at the same time, he is not a good person. He's evil. And one of the things that makes him stand out to me is often in stories that are considered Kane stories, he's not always the main character, but he can be a villain or an evil presence sort of surrounding the story that's happening and influencing events. As I sort of mentioned earlier, Cain is loosely based on uh, Cain from the Cain and Abel story in the Old Testament. And for people who might not be familiar with it, Cain killed his brother and then was cursed by God to basically walk the earth forever as an immortal. And there's different stories revolving that and there's ideas that his descendants are are the ones who like are the evil and in our planet there's also ideas that cain can only be killed if something he starts like he can only be responsible for his own death so something he starts will have to come around and kill him so he's always going to be the he's going to be the one to perpetuate his own death So what would you say is Cain's personality? Is he villainous? You know, Carl Edward Wagner said he's amoral, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. And definitely one thing that caught my eye as I read Bloodstone. I'm not even sure. Yeah, yeah, I think he was in the first chapter, but nonetheless, it feels like he comes in later because at the start, he plays this kind of secondary role. Mostly it was like, hey, there's these different kingdoms. Here's some intrigue, some light Game of Thrones stuff. And then, oh, hey, in the woods, there's this big fella with red hair and blue eyes that kind of freaks out the other bandits he's hanging with. And then he gets this ring. And every once in a while, we check in on him. Then he becomes this kind of manipulator. Yeah, like, it's unusual. There are Conan stories where he's not right there at the beginning. Mm-hmm. But with Sword and Sorcery, you tend to have characters who are looking at things from the ground up. With Kane, you often start there, but he'll quickly ascend to being second in command of a whole country. And he's convincing the leader of that country, like, yeah, yeah, no, I'll help you out. Ulterior motive? I don't have any. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Like, he just seems so much more of a manipulator Mm -hmm. than you ever run into with Conan, Fafford, and Grey Mouser, uh, Jarell, Jory, Elric. Yet there's that. Would you say it's maybe a tragic thing with him that he's sort of just doing it because what else is he going to do? He's been around so damn long. How do you feel about that tragic angle? Yeah, the huge tragedy of the story of Cain is immortality and how how does immortality change a person because you end up no longer being human yourself. There's the idea of the mark of Cain and it's the mark of Cain will let people know who Cain is. That's the, the, the biblical idea. And I think that Carl Edward Wagner plays with that idea a little bit with the icy blue eyes that Cain has. And he, he talks about like, as you mentioned, that people are put off by his stare. And what I've always thought of those passages is that the way that an immortal would look at a human is so different 
from the way that humans would look at each other so people can just tell that they're being examined as animals and not as fellow humans. So I've kind of interpreted that as the mark of Cain in Wagner's books. And you see that he brings this up uh, multiple times. There's several of the Cain stories that have to do with the fact that Cain can never really know love. It's hard for him to connect to people. And it does, it, he's messing with kingdoms and it's because he's bored sometimes, you know? And sometimes I think that there's a little bit of playing with the idea that Cain has to be the cause of his own destruction and that he's trying to sort of start fights to end his own life a bit, a little bit. There's a little bit of self-destructive nature in how he's doing things. Right, because he's immortal, but he's not superhuman. He's bloody tough and smart and all the rest because he's been around so long. But like, if I understand correctly, if he's in a sword fight, he could die. He's just extremely capable, so it's unlikely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like your idea that maybe he generates this chaos because he can't bring himself to his life more directly, let's say. But if he just makes a big enough of a clusterfuck and puts himself at the middle of it, then maybe... Yeah. <laughs> But he always has that urge to survive, right? Yeah. Even in really intense situations, he's always like, I'm going to do everything I can to get through this. It's really neat. Something else that uh, sets him apart from other sword and sorcery heroes. Uh, actually, that brings me to my next question. Wagner didn't really like the term sword and sorcery. Would you be able to tell us a little bit about why that was, how he defined his cane stories, and whether you would call them sword and sorcery? Yeah, he would sometimes call the sword and sorcery boom of the 60s thud and blunder instead of the blood and thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I think, I mean, he seems, my impression of him, he's a bit of a contrarian and um, he didn't like the masses. The masses are tend to be into the lowest common denominator things sometimes, you know? And so publishers are just churning out all this stuff. I mean, you know, he one of the things he makes fun of is the fact that, for lack of a better word, gentlemen's magazines were starting to publish fantasy because they thought they could make a buck off of it. Wasn't his first story published that way? His his first, yeah. Yeah. His first novel was published by, uh, I think it was Powell was the publisher. Kind of gives me a Kilgore Trout vibe, you know, yeah. uh, Kurt Vonnegut's alter ego. Yeah. Like, great ideas, terrible stories, all published in the middle of porno magazines as filler, which is such an odd thing to contemplate in this digital age. But yeah, please go on. Yeah, and they and he he was pissed when they published it because they butchered it. They edited out thousands and thousands of words. They changed things around. So he he definitely had a low amount of respect for for a lot of the publishers that were just churning out this stuff for people to buy. So I think that's partially why he was not so much into the sword and sorcery was that connection that you have with this mass produced, not as thought out stuff. He also, from what I've read from interviews of his and a good friend of his, a friend of his from high school, John Mayer, has said is that he didn't really read too much fantasy growing up. And a lot of the stuff he read was gothic, gothic works, gothic horror. And he considered Cain like a gothic type character, which I 100% agree with. I think you can see a lot of the markings of gothic literature in his work. And so he, you know, had this gothic idea, but he was also, you know, he's a guy of the 60s. He was a psychiatrist. He had, he was, um, he was a doctor. He was into expanding his horizons through psychotropic drugs. So he's kind of bringing this modern sensibility and mixing it with gothic literature. And so he uh, had the phrase that his works were not certain sources. They were acid gothic, which I, I love that term. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's very evocative. Yeah. And yeah, the gothic connection. Listener, you read one page and you'll be like, ah, oh, yes, I see what they're talking about. Uh, it's very, very rich and thick in there. In particular, I'm thinking of the introduction of Cain, which, as I say, is not always in the first chapter. In the third novel of his I've read, Darkness Weaves, where he's living in one of many, many, many cave, like multiple grave things on the side of a cliff and just the lightning. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. That is the most gothic <laughs> entrance and that's another thing that i love is it's just to me it's just badass it's like i live in this basically cemetery carved into the side of the mountain because yeah it's a good place to hide from his enemies and it'll freak out anybody he deigns to have visit him it really puts things on his terms when he has a guest brought up to him at the beginning of that novel so actually to come back to the pro side of things wagner did say about those ten thousand words at the start of that notebook uh, my quote here is the prose was a bit heavy but i liked it that way yeah how would you describe, I mean, we're talking a bit about the gothic element here. Mm -hmm. How would you describe Wagner's prose, his voice, when he's running Kane? 
I would describe some of it is poetic. I think there's a lot of interludes in the the Cain work about his musings. So there's a lot of sort of philosophical musings in his work. I, I find his prose like pretty straightforward. I think he was a pretty straightforward storytelling or a storyteller and the way that he wrote. And his dialogue, I think, is something to mention because he got dinged for it a lot at the time that he's writing. And some people ding him for it now was he used modern language you know, he used modern swearing, he wouldn't, but it's something he's he's talked about in a couple of his interviews, which is, you know, this is a fantasy world, they're not speaking these languages, it's the job of the translator to put it into our language and how we speak, and they're, he didn't believe in that separation, which is often, you know, false anyway, that everyone would be speaking in some sort of like weird, not quite british e accent. Yeah, like the elevated these and those, yeah. Yeah. So that's something interesting, too. There's a little bit of humor every once in a while. I think Wagner is also a bit of a trickster, so sometimes he'll mention modern things in his Kane writing. He'll have, like, lyrics to different, like, songs and albums that he was into. There's, like, a really infamous description in the beginning of Bloodstone where he's describing, like, all the creatures in the plant and stuff and it's like a reference to uh one of the earlier pink floyd songs which i'm, I'm blanking on the name of the song right now but yeah I'll, I'll have to send you the exact quote and what song it is to link up future oliver here back again to read you what jordan sent me about the whole pink floyd connection here's what he said quote several species of small furry animals gathered together in a cave and grooving with a pict often referred to as several species of small furry animals dot 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 is on the 1969 Pink Floyd album, Umagoma. Bloodstone on the first page, second paragraph of the prologue reads, Several species of small furry animals pick their way through caves and grooves in the moss-hung debris of fallen branches and cast-off leaves of many seasons. Coincidence? Jordan says. I think not. <laughs> okay, back to the present. So there's like little fun modern things placed in there. Yeah, I enjoyed that while reading it, though this does create kind of a curious effect when reading it now, right? Because it's not that he layers it heavy with, oh no, it's the fuzz when cops show up or something, like it's not that obvious, but there was the odd line of dialogue where I was like, ah yes, this modern 1977 dialogue now reads a little different to me in 2021. Yeah. And it's kind of like this extra layer of remove, which is someone who's reading this to study this stuff, I find it very interesting and entertaining, but I wonder how jarring it would be. Like, imagine watching a movie, a Western set in the 1860s, but everybody talks like gangsters from the 1920s. Yeah, it just adds that extra layer of, okay, all right, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, it doesn't get in the way of enjoying the stories, but it is a curious thing. Yeah. And it makes me wonder if he wasn't born a few decades too early, because, like, Joe Abercrombie, I believe, with his very popular books, has his characters, like... I just finished his first Law Trilogy. Why am I saying I believe? I know he has his characters speak in a fairly modern fashion. You know, none of them, actually now I think about it, some of them might say motherfucker and things like that. Now that I think about it. I, I think so. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. So it's just this kind of thing of, oh, if he'd been published now, he wouldn't have been dinged for it. It would have been like, ooh, how contemporary, how daring, how grimdark. But that's another genre and another story. <laughs> But yeah, so it's an interesting mix of, as you say, the poetic and the gothic, which would have been old then, and then him putting his contemporary dialogue in, which now reads differently, Pink Floyd not really being a contemporary reference anymore, but still would have been very cool and hip then. Yeah, yeah I think he's got a really unique voice. It really stands out from Moorcock and the rest. Although one thing, and I'd be curious to hear if you agree with me on this, this thing of occasionally having Cain just musing darkly and philosophically, taking a break from his Massianians, just being like, you know, what's his inner dialogue right now? Uh, would you agree it's something he didn't take? You know, he learned, you know, he learned from your influences uh, from Howard, right? Mm. Because it seems a common trick in a lot of Howard's better stories where you'll have this break right before the climax of the story, the big action, where Conan will be like, ah, oh, yes. You know, he'll ruminate in a similar fashion. Mm -hmm. Does that feel like a connection to you? Yeah, it does. I'm, I'm curious if it's something he got from Howard or if it's something that he understood structurally. Because you see that in action movies, too. They always have, like, that moment of arming up, like, putting up the barricades, you know, loading the weapons, whatever it is. I think it's a structural thing that works really well for action things, especially in the Kane novels, where they're, they're usually, they usually end in a large, like, set-piece battle. 
So I'm really curious. I think it's interesting that you brought up Howard as well, because Wagner didn't grow up reading Howard. He like was exposed to him a little bit later. So a lot of people will say like, oh no, like he wasn't influenced by him at all. And I totally disagree with that. I think that Wagner was definitely influenced by Howard. So I'm also not saying like, no, no way it wasn't Howard. But maybe he came to it later in life because he wrote that pastiche or two, Yeah, didn't he? Yeah, he wrote The Road to Kings. And then um, he also had a second one, Day of the Lion, which he never actually wrote. I The papers he has on that is at, actually, it's at John Hayes. So that's the, sort of the next thing that I want to go and, <laughs> and look oh, at. Oh, cool. All right. Because um, he, he also wrote the Brian McMorn novel, Legion. Right. Brian McMorn being uh, one of Robert E. Howard's other big characters, who was a Pictish king of the doomed Picts as the Romans were slowly working their way through them. Yeah. Right, right. Um, so he had, he had that exposure. And then he also edited three volumes of Conan stories. And he was like one of the first editors to say, I want to publish these how Howard originally wrote them. I'm going to take out all of the stuff that was added. I'm going to put back in all of the stuff that was cut. So he valued Howard and Howard's original writing. So like to me, it doesn't matter whether or not he read Howard as a kid. Like he was definitely reading him throughout the rest of his life and had an appreciation of his work. And I think in some of the larger battles, like Dark Crusade, the large battle about halfway through that really reminds me of some of the large battles in the Conan books, even with the fact that one of the character ends up like crawling through the mud and the reeds, which I feel like happens <laughs> in multiple uh, Howard Conan stories. Yeah, I think at least one comes to mind. Uh, and yeah, I agree with what you say. So what if he came to Howard a little later in life? He certainly put his time and money and energy where his mouth was in terms of his dedication to the original prose, because he was also one of the many people who I think went a little further with it than some who really didn't care for something I've talked about on the show a few times before, the attempt to string together all of Conan into one cohesive linear saga by Lynn Carter and L. Sprank to camp there. Yeah, he really criticized them and then did those collections you mentioned, which were much truer to the original yeah. text. And I think that's a much better thing to do when trying to preserve someone's work. Yeah. <laughs> then glue it together like, I can fix this. What are you fixing? And I think, like, one of the things that I, when I'm coming at, at writers and looking at writers, like, I love to see influences from one writer to another. And sometimes, you know, I'll be like, oh, isn't this great, this influence? Like, you can see this here, you can see that there. And sometimes people, I feel like sometimes people get angry about it. But I really like that. And I think the good writers are saying, like, this, this works and I'm going to do this too, but I'm going to put my spin on it. And I think that Wagner very much did that. He saw what worked. He was a storyteller and he was able to be like, I'm going to use this person's techniques here for this because that will make this scene work the best. And then I'm going to take something from someone over here. I mean, you know, it's like, I think the best artists in any medium steal what works for what they need it for. And I think Wagner was very good at that. Yeah, and I would argue that there's a difference between theft and picking up tools that yeah. others have already made for you, yeah. right? Obviously, I have a vested interest in this because here I am writing this sword and sorcery novel, and as we're recording this, I'm working on a section. I'll just own this up front. It's very Fritz Leiber, Fafnir and Grey Mouser inspired. Yeah. But as much as I'm studying these stories and even have one or two story slots in my story outline labeled like my Ilmet and Lankmar or my version of or whatever, right? I think I understand what Carl Edward Wagner was doing in the... Like, I'm not sitting down, like, literally, I'm going to copy this thing. It's just a case of what's making me feel juiced to write. And I've looked at it and seen a couple of cool little judo moves in there, a couple of interesting tools, and then I will go from there because this story will always be filtered through who I am, my lived experiences, and all of the other things I've read and taken in. All the other stories that have sluiced through my skull, you know? So, yeah, I think it's funny when people get mad when you say, I think this writer you like was influenced by so-and-so. And they're all like, oh, you're saying he's got no original ideas? No, I'm just saying they weren't God himself creating the universe from nothing. Yeah, yeah, I 100% I agree with you. And that being said, too, I was like, I read this one thing and it's like, oh, this is totally Riders on the Storm. Like, this is him referencing Riders on the Storm by the doors. And then when I was at Brown, I saw the date that he originally wrote the story and it was written like three years before Riders on the Storm came out. So it's like, oh, okay, I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but a fun idea. And there you go, right? This is what makes me sympathetic again sometimes to Carter and to Camp, because boy, we have the human urge to be like, but what if it is one grand narrative? Yeah. What if it connects? Yeah. <laughs> you gotta start somewhere, though. And where would you say is a good place to start reading Kane? 
because I leapt into the novels, but increasingly I hear people say, I don't know, man, you should have started with this short story. What are your feelings about that? Where would you begin if you were trying to set someone who's never read Kane before off on their own little voyage? I would say you could start with either a novel or a book of short stories. If you start with a novel, I would say go for Bloodstone because it's got a good mix of Kane as manipulator, and it has the super awesome mashup that Wagner does of science fiction and fantasy. And it has some of his, I think, very acid gothic, like he's describing acid trips, you know, on the page. So you get like a good selection of a lot of different things you'd find in Kane. And then the short story collection Night Winds is amazing. That is my favorite Kane book. It's just a book of short stories. It's Oh, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta breathe because I'm so excited talking about it. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's Kane, and you get to see all these different aspects of Kane. You get to see Kane as a hero. You get to see Kane. You know, one of the stories he's he's waxing philosophical with a giant about what it means for time to pass and kingdoms to rise and fall. Another one, you see him as 100% a terrible villain. You see him as like basically a domestic abuser. You know, Kane's not a good guy. And it's it's examining some of the stuff about his need for love is damaging other people. And then you get to see, you know, more horrific tales about ghosts and demons. And uh, there's even like a really gothic one with like family secrets and secret passages at an old rundown inn. It's just got a great selection of different modes of cane. And it's, yeah, it's just a really solid collection. Cool. Well, you and I were saying earlier in this very interview how hard it is to get the books, but are these available as ebooks at least? Maybe, like, how can someone who's not lucky enough to live in a place with a lot of good secondhand bookstores or be willing to spend a little extra to get an old paperback shipped to them from Timbuktu, you know, what's the most accessible way to get their hands on this stuff? Yeah, so luckily the Kane books are available on as ebooks. I mean, they're, they're ebooks, so they're really cheap. I think they're like two ninety nine or three ninety nine. So it's definitely worth, I think, getting them and reading them instead of waiting for, you know, prices to drop or anything like that. And also it's good because you can get one, read it, see if it's your thing, you know, instead of waiting to shell out, you know, like 60 bucks or something for a for a paperback. Yeah, because unfortunately at this point in time, I'm not aware of any anyway, uh, there are no publishers reprinting it. Is there something I'm unaware of or that you've heard of or? Yeah, not that I know of. I know people are frequently asking how to find who, who has the rights to him. His family still has the rights, so... Uh, Oh, okay, okay. Well, this is total gossip, but I believe I saw, probably on the Whetstone Discord, that the family has the estate, whatever, but they're not sure how to go about it. There's some business savvy missing in there. I don't know, man. It's all just fishwives gossip, but I would love to see these being reprinted again. I've been lucky enough to live near the Merrill Collection. I've mentioned many times on the podcast before, a big speculative archive in Toronto. What a blessing. I'm like down the block. And they have all the original paperbacks, as well as those big hardcover collections from 2015, which I could be wrong, but those could be the centipede collections. One of uh, all three novels, Darkness Falls, and one of all the poetry, Midnight Sun, as well as the essay I've quoted a few times today. And uh, Yeah, those were um, the, the Nightshade books. Nightshade, pardon me, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and those are going for like 150 minimum. And when I find them online, a part of me is like, maybe, because <laughs> like they're beautiful books, but that's a bit much to ask of someone like, yeah, I want to try out Kane, 150 plus shipping. <laughs> so thank you for pointing out those affordable eBooks. I'll link those in the show notes. Meanwhile, we've been talking a lot about Kane. But Dark Crusade isn't just about Kane. It's also about Wagner's horror writing, which you mentioned a little bit before. What would you say defines Wagner's approach to horror? What makes a Wagner horror story? His gothic elements, maybe? Or... Yeah, I mean, he was a good writer, so he wrote in different modes. Um, He has gothic horror, he has... Stuff that I would say is really regional horror, which is super cool. He was from Knoxville, Tennessee originally, and then he ended up living in North Carolina. So there's a lot of like horror that's, I feel like, regional to uh, Appalachia. And uh, he's also, he wrote a lot of erotic horror as well. Go on. Which is, yeah, really cool. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. not to be a goof, like whatever. I like to not be a child about such things, but erotic horror is a hell of a phrase. If you don't mind, I'm sincerely asking, like, what is entailed with erotic horror, like more visceral descriptive sex scenes, or what, what makes that? Yeah, um, it's it's more descriptive sex scenes. There's also, I think, a lot of power play is used in, like, the sexual roles that partners have with each other. Basically, some of the horror can be things just, like, linked through the desire for people. He has a, a really great one called Beyond Any Measure that's 
like sort of a vampire tale. It's, it's sort of Carmilla-esque a little bit. Oh, cool. But yeah, so it's just adding more of the eroticism to power and attraction. I think it plays with the idea of sort of like love or like sex and death and how they're kind of intertwined. Okay, and he was pretty prolific with his horror writing, right? So what would be your recommendation for where new readers could start when checking out his horror stories? So his horror stories, he only has two books of short stories for horror. I mean, he has a third... Oh, pardon me. I'm getting confused because he edited so many volumes of Year's yeah. Best Horror Stories, right? Like a dozen? Yeah, he did. I think he did Year's Best Horror 8 through 22. Oh, well, there you go. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think my brain took that number and inflated how much horror writing he did. But it was basically the other side of the coin with him, right? Kane and horror was the majority of his stuff. So what were those two collections then? Where would you point someone who wants to check out his horror? So what sucks is they are so hard to get your hands on and they're so expensive. But In a Lonely Place was his first collection. Why Not You and I was his second collection. And then he had a, a posthumous collection called Exorcisms and Ecstasies, which has some Kane stuff. It was like uncollected Kane stories, uncollected horror stories, and some essays by friends and industry people just about him. And and In the Lonely Place is a really good collection, his first collection. It has a short story called Sticks, which is his most published horror story. Um, and that's a really great one. I mean, that's where, you know, a lot of people believe that that's where the Blair Witch Project got their stick witch things from. Right. And theoretically, first season of True Detective. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that's the most reprinted story of his, I believe. So, so that one's fairly easy to get your hands on. So that would be a good place to start to kind of get a feeling for his work. One of my personal favorite stories is called In a Lonely Place. And it's a married couple that aren't doing very well go on vacation to a cabin in in the mountains in the Appalachian Range. And it's like one of those things where it's a sort of a modern, deeper riff or different type of riff on Oliver Onion's story, The Beckoning Fair One. Yeah, that's just a really great story. And that's been reprinted a couple of times. So if you can get your hands on that one. Okay, cool. And has any of this made it to the Gutenberg Project or elsewhere people can read it online? Not yet. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> oh, nuts. Okay. Maybe this is a dead end and I'm just imagining something more exciting than what actually was. But do you feel Wagner's abandoned education in psychiatry had any effect on his writing? Feels like that kind of study might give you a leg up on, say, character motivations and certainly his horror writing. Yeah, 100%. And he actually, he got through medical school and he was operating as a doctor for a couple of months. Oh, pardon me. So he actually did finish. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see that in Kane even. He often looks at the psychology of his characters and a lot of his characters are, you see motivations of why people are doing what they're doing. It's not always necessarily them making the healthiest choice, but you can kind of see the point in which they made those decisions. That's also something that is really interesting to me about his writing. I can't help but see some of the things about his own, you know, his own life and read it into his stories. And it's not like the best thing to do all the time because like you can't say, oh, this is the author airing this, this, and this about their own life. Like that's not fair and not truthful either. But I, I think you can see authors exploring ideas and exploring the things that are on their minds. And sometimes I feel like I can almost see him exploring maybe some of the issues he had in his life and some of the issues that I personally have had in my life as well. So that, that psychological aspect to his horror has is, is always been really appealing to me. Well, that's really interesting. If you're comfortable sharing, what is it you saw in yourself and your life that you saw maybe in his life and then in turn in the writing in this like three point connection here? Well, what would be an example of that? I think um, he talks about like very self-destructive in nature, that self-destructive bent where you'll, you'll put yourself in situations where you've endangered yourself. There's also like issues with unhealthy relationships and addiction. And so that's some things that, that I've definitely encountered in my life. And it, yeah, it really speaks to me and a pretty powerful way. Oh, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So we're getting to the end here, and I will be rating your answer on the Brackenbury shame meter You will be judged harshly. Yes. And I want to encourage all listeners to point and laugh if your answer is insufficient. Now, I am talking to you primarily as a podcaster and scholar of Wagner's work, but I'm curious. I know you've done some playwriting. Have you done any prose writing? Publication doesn't have to be on the table, and if you just have your own journal that you've only filled the first few pages of or whatever that we're going to find under a glass case years from now, it's fine. You know, well, what's been your experience? 
Yeah, so I started out as a playwright and I've written a couple of plays in 1X. You know, I kind of set it aside for a while and I've been kind of creeping back into writing and I've been sort of like, I kind of like eased into it by writing some uh, Dark Souls fan fiction. If you know the Dark Souls video games. (laughs) I know that whenever I visit my friend Tom, he makes me play the damn thing and I can never beat the first guy and then he shames me by making me watch him beat the first guy. Yeah, no. (laughs) Oh, Get good, he says. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's what you gotta do. So I kind of like did some writing exercises, writing about certain characters in that series. And I've been sort of playing with that and and writing some more horror and trying to write a little bit of like, one of them is definitely like Solomon Kane influenced characters. But it's, it's been really interesting because since so much of my experience was writing for the stage, I mean, it's just a whole other beast. Imagine writing a novel and taking away everything that's not dialogue. It's like, <laughs> wow, like, how do I write descriptions? And how, how do I tell this story? And I don't need to explain as much in dialogue because you get to see descriptions and I have to provide those descriptions. And so that when I first sat down to start writing, I was like, wow, this is a lot of writing to get like from point one to to point one point three in the story. It's a lot of words. I'm used to being able to have like, you know, two pages of dialogue and I'm there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, I sympathize. The majority of my writing and writing education has been screenwriting. Yeah. So, you know, even though this is my third novel, I'll find myself thinking, right, people care about typos in these a lot more, you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I'm not just doing a blueprint like so and so goes over there. Well, What can I say? It's been so nice talking with you here, and I'm really happy to see a face and a person here to go with the dude online who has the Noid as his avatar, which I love, love seeing the Noid. If anybody wants to have some fun, Google why they retired the Noid. It's messed up. Oh, no. Oh, you don't know? I just assumed. No. Oh, (laughs) well, that's going to be our cliffhanger. Why was the Noid retired? Did it involve something terrible in real life? Um... But in the meanwhile, I really want to strongly encourage everyone to check out Dark Crusade. It's on the hiatus right now, but I'm recording this in early November 2021, and you're probably hearing this in January 2022 because of how I do things. So I don't know. It might be different by then. Uh, currently, it's on hiatus, but you have every intention of bringing yeah, it back, Yeah, I right? actually have an episode of Reflections for the Winter of My Soul that's recorded, and it's an editing stage right now. So that should be out in the winter. And then the plan is you yeah, had to bring it back and move forward in a much slower release rate but to actually have a release rate and not you know this extended hiatus well it's tricky right because you want to feed the hashtag content machine but you also have the rest of your life to deal with yeah i've been doing this four times a month since i started back in mid-june and i want to keep it up until at least the end of the year but already a part of me is like eh, i could use some more time to work on the actual novel that this dang thing is supposed to be building an audience for and supporting kind of deal maybe i should do it every other week for a while especially because i can't help myself, especially with interviews, I do like the white glove surgical level edit. I tried to take the advice of Hoy from the Appendix and Book Club podcast when I interviewed him. He encouraged me, like, just leave some ums in. It's okay. And I was like, is it though? (laughs) (laughs) I tried to relax with his episode that went right back to my ways with the next one. So, you know, there's also one self you have to fight a little bit. But I think at the end of the day, one thing that's been important for me to remember, and I'm just saying this one creator to another, I'm not trying to instruct you, this is just my philosophy, and it took a while to get there. I did YouTube videos back in the day, and with those, I killed myself trying to keep to a schedule as if someone was going to yell at me or fire me from my YouTube show. (laughs) People are basically fine if there's a delay. Only the most toxic jerk who's just looking for a reason to be a jerk will have anything to say. Meanwhile, it's free to subscribe to a YouTube channel. It's free to subscribe to a podcast. It costs nothing to maintain that subscription. You just have an extra thumbnail in your app or whatever you like to use. And so, yeah, again, I'd encourage listeners. I think I think Dark Crusade is great. I think Jordan has plenty of insightful things to say above and beyond what you've heard today. And yeah, Jordan, is there anything else? Like, do you have a Twitter account you'd like people to follow you on? Or do you have any other projects? Or is it just, quote, Unquote, listeners, uh, I'm doing heavy finger quotes here. Is it just the Dark Crusade podcast? 
Yeah, definitely check out the Dark Crusade podcast. I'm also a freelance editor. I do proofreading as well. So you can check that out at Jordan Smith Editing. Also, I am an actor as well. And I recently appeared in the film The Spine of Night, which might be of interest to people listening to this. (laughs) I watched that last night. Crap, how have I not asked you about this? That's great too. Yeah, so so I did the motion reference. It says, so it's a rotoscoped film like Fire and Ice. And I did the motion reference for a character called Galsor, and then I also did his voice as well. So I did the voice and the movement for uh, Galsor. It's already out in theaters. It's kind of rolling out to different theaters across the country, so it may be playing around you, it may not be. But please, if like support like awesome, gnarly sword and sorcery, rent it. It's really fun. And the, the two directors of it are like their sword and sorcery guys. They like they they love it, you know. One of the, the drives behind it too was to take some of this love that they had for 70s and 80s sword and sorcery and fantasy but, you know, give it modern sensibilities and fix some of the things that, that aren't the best about about uh, looking back. Yeah. Well, yeah, the older period stuff. But this, I mean, this definitely, I was on board with it. I, oh, Man, now I'm all stopped up with things we could discuss regarding the movie. But listeners, I'd say definitely check it out. It's been updated for 2021. It's funny too, right? Because it has a butt ton of nudity, which to me feels very sore and sorcery, but everybody's naked, by which I mean it's not a male gazy film. It doesn't feel that way to me at all. It's like a lot of non-sexualized nudity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And to me, it comes into that whole sword and sorcery feel of just bodies, man. You know, it's very primal. You're never, well, rarely going to see a sword and sorcery hero of any gender in full medieval plate mail. It's not the look, just not the feel. And yeah, the movie got that across. God, I forgot you were in that. (laughs) <laughs> oh, well, the important thing was your podcast, which I will ask one last question. Uh, you reminded me of this with Talk of Animation. You have little portraits for several of your interview guests in your earlier episodes, and it looks like the same art style as your show logo. Did you do those? No, it's a wonderful, wonderful artist, Andrea Sparacio. She's she's great. Yeah, really, really great artist. Awesome. Okay, well, throw me a link and I'll put it in the show notes. All right, well, I'll talk forever as Everybody knows, but the nice thing about podcasts is I can more easily make me shut up and say thank you so much for coming here to talk in the gaps between me flapping my gums. It's been so nice to thank meet you, you. Proper like here. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk to you about all this stuff. Awesome. All right, everybody. Dark Crusade. Go check it out in the links and stuff. And uh, yeah, let's end this conversation. My God. <laughs> Bye. So I'm Writing a Novel features original music by Gloria Guns and is hosted by yours truly, Oliver Brackenbury. If you'd like to submit a question, then please email it to so I'm writing a novel at gmail.com. Bonus points if you record yourself and send me an mp3 I can cut into the show. Doesn't have to be fancy. Using your phone is fine. Just keep it clear and concise. You can also holler at the show on Twitter. Look for at so underscore writing at so writing. Please consider sharing the show with anybody who might like it leaving a review on iTunes, and checking out patreon.com slash so I'm writing a novel. Patrons get to be thanked in the final novel, listen to episodes of the podcast a week early, and even enjoy a bonus podcast called So I Wrote a Novel, where I read and comment on chapters of previous works, starting with my first novel, Junkyard Leopard. Thanks for hanging out with me, and Jordan, and I'll see you soon.